Hello? Hey Brad, it's Dan again. Uh, listen, I have done everything that you've told me to do to a T. And uh, I'm getting ready to paint, and I was just wondering if you had any other, you know, quick tips for me before I get started. Uh, all right, w what are you going to use to paint it? Um, I've got this old bucket of house paint and a trim roller and a slightly used paintbrush uh, that I think might do the job. Dan, do you have any idea what the heck you're doing? I think I've made it pretty clear right now that I have zero idea what I'm doing. Listen, bud. That's a good looking guitar. <laughs> I'd, I'd hate for you to screw it up with house paint and a roller. Why don't you just send it to me and I'll give it a real paint job. Praise the Lord. I thought you'd never ask. Okay, I'll ship it off to you ASAP. Where do you live? Canada. Oh, you're one of those guys. And what's that supposed to mean? Oh, oh nothing. You know, it's just like Canada is like a loft apartment above a really great party. What? What? Nothing. Never mind. Guitars in the mail. No taxi backsies. Okay, bye. Silly Americans, don't even realize the real party's always in the penthouse. What have I gotten myself into? Where was I? Eh. What's up guys, apparently Dan's guitar is here now. He sent it to me, as you probably know by now. And uh, yeah, we're gonna save it from that deluxe roller finish that he was thinking of putting on there. Let's go take a look and see what he's done with this thing. There's Lottie box, a couple of dings in it. Hopefully those were there before he sent it to me. Last time I opened a guitar kit in a Muslati box, I was less than impressed. But it hadn't received the magic Dan Thompson touch. So let's see what we're dealing with here. I, of course, watched Dan's video on this uh, and he, what he did to replace the top of it. If you haven't seen it, check it out. His link's in the description. I'm sure if you're watching my channel, you're probably also watching his. Guns and Guitars, awesome work. Uh, yeah, he manages to do a lot with a little, if you will. He, uh, he makes budget tools and everything, does budget finishes, and they all look awesome. So if you haven't already, check him out. Okay, well, start with the easy part. All right, a little bit of glue on here that we'll take off for him. Touch on the dry side. Neck, uh, neck work is as much up Dan's alley as it is up mine. In fact, he's probably better at it than I am. So I assume he doesn't want a whole lot done with that except for a finish, which is definitely up my alley, and we're going to do that. Let's take a look at the body. That is taped right to the box. What kind of lunatic does that? Come on, man. Okay, that actually kind of makes sense. I, I don't know why nobody tapes their stuff to the box. I'm going to wrap this thing in duct tape to send it back to you, Dan. Need a tutorial on how to unwrap this. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I can tell that that was, that's going to be worth it. Whew. That is nice. That is really nice. This patch... Is that attached? Yeah, that's glued right on there. Okay, so that's solid now and filled in. I guess I'm just gonna paint right over that. This appears to be, it's got screw holes in it. So I imagine that that is designed to come out. Um, so I'll take that out and finish it separately. This is beautiful. I, the pickup cavities, or the pickup, yeah, cavities, appear to have been hand routed because when you're Dan Thompson, you can get away with stuff like that, apparently. And yet somehow, I could tell that those are hand routed, but these look wonderful. They look pretty much perfect. Uh, I, yeah, this thing's actually awesome. Dan has rather foolishly given me creative freedom on this project. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now thinking of what exactly I want to do to both do a good job and possibly also mess with him a bit. But what we can do right now without having to put any further thought into it is get taping. Let's get started. In an effort to get through this project in one video, we're not going to go quite as deep into the explanations today as usual. So if you decide you need more, uh, you know where to find it on my channel. But for now, we're jumping straight into voiceover here and we're going to get started on this project. 
So this guitar is already sanded down really nice. Dan did a great job. He grain filled it and everything. The curvature to it is beautiful. And he's done a nice job routing and everything. So we're dealing with a really smooth finish on this. Uh, and we can get started right away with the taping part. I'm taping off the neck pocket here. That's an important aspect here because the neck fits in there really nice and tight. And if you fill that up with finish, it's not going to fit anymore. So important to tape the neck pocket off in those circumstances so that the neck's going to still fit in the pocket. Next, I'm also going to tape up the pickup cavities. This is less critical, but I don't know what Dan's got in mind for his shielding, if he's going to be using a shielding paint, if he's going to be copper taping. I'm not sure what he's got in mind. Uh, it looks like, based on the, the sizes of the routes, that he probably doesn't need to do anything there because he's going to be using you know, some form of humbucker or P90, but if he wants that option, the pickup cavity should be nice and clean because I've taped them off. On the back cavity here, I've gone through and put tape on the back of the switch hole so that protects that and then I just cover this area with tape, kind of push it down into the corner and run the razor blade right along the corner and I get a nice clean tape line along this. And because I'm running that razor blade on the inside corner, I don't have to worry about gouging the finish at all. I trim my excess off here so that I don't have to worry about any foldovers that are accidental and go unnoticed. I don't have to worry too much about any kind of weird buildup because of excess tape. And we're basically ready to start here as far as the body is concerned. Now for the neck, I don't want to paint the fretboard. That's That would be kind of ridiculous. I imagine Dan will probably consider oiling it. So what I'm going to do is tape it off so that I don't have to worry about that. And the finish that I'm going to put on the neck is going to be very thin and actually kind of going to be more the type of finish that you would see Dan put on in one of his videos because I think that those finishes are nice and comfortable to play. And I thought it would be neat to have part of this guitar have like that same kind of feel that he gives his finishes. So I'm actually going to start with the neck here because the beginning part's very straightforward. I'm mixing some red dye into water so it'll soak in nicely um, so I get nice deep penetration with this. It's a trans tint dye. If you need any of the stuff that I'm using in this video including the dyes, the pigments, anything like that and most of the equipment it's all available through the Amazon link in the description if you want to help me out and it doesn't cost you anything extra there but if you don't want to help me out that's fine too. Take a look at it there and find it yourself afterward. So I'm taping off a portion of the neck around the headstock now. This water-based dye dries really quickly, so that's not a problem. And I want to be able to paint the face of the headstock without having to mess with any of the rest of this. The face of the headstock itself will get a similar finish to the body, whereas, as I said, the remainder of the neck is going to get more that classic Dan Thompson type of thing, or at least my interpretation on it. I'm balling up paint to put in the tuning peg holes but you can also use earplugs, they work quite well. I didn't have any handy. And now it's time for me to begin sealing. So in order to get a nice smooth finish, we don't want to waste a ton of paint, so we start off with a sealer. This is the Vinyl Sealer um, by Bellin. My understanding is this is discontinued now, but I should have a link available shortly to the Easy Seal uh, product by Mohawk, which is the replacement and is essentially the same thing. I use a relatively large nozzle size for this, I believe I'm spraying with a 1.5 here. And I just apply it with these nice even passes, about 50% overlap on my fan as you can see with the occasional touch up because the sealer really isn't that finicky. Generally go for about 3 coats of this and I apply them kind of medium heavy because they're sealer and we want a substantial build up. And this product actually dries really quickly so there's no problem with that, it's hard enough to go ahead and sand within a relatively short time. Now you may have noticed that I have a camera mounted right to my gun here because apparently I thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and take some footage right from the gun so that I can make you essentially motion sick as I show you a little bit of the point of view that nobody would actually have when they're spraying here. So we'll get to that in just a second. Like I said, I'm doing my three coats here and I'm going to let this dry overnight so that I can come back and sand it the next day and be ready to go with the next portion of my painting project. If you want to really go on the safe side or if you're using, for example, a lacquer sanding sealer, I would suggest giving that three days to dry before you move on just so that you're not dealing with any of the risks of it not hardening properly. So this is what we look like now. Uh, this guitar has kind of a satiny sheen to it from that sealer. And you can kind of tell by looking at it that it's nice and sealed up and smooth. 
You'll see that here that I'm not actually wearing my mask while I sand because sometimes I'm just not that bright, but you should be wearing a mask while you're sanding, particularly if you're sanding a finish like this. It's certainly not good for you to be doing that without a mask or proper safety equipment in general. So keep that in mind. Get yourself a respirator. If you don't have one, feel free to check out the link in the description for Amazon, like I said. But in any event, you should be wearing something for both the spraying and the sanding processes here. The objective with this sanding is to abrade the surface so the new paint will stick properly, but also to make sure it's nice and flat, which is why I'm using a block. And at the end there, I was using a little piece of very flat acrylic. Now I'm cleaning it off with the wax and grease remover. That's kind of the last step to prepare it for the new coats. And I'm going to mix up some acrylic here. This is an aluminum acrylic base with some extra sparkle from AutoWare Colors Hot Rod Sparkle. It's kind of a iridescent uh, sparkle additive that they've got that you can put in pretty much any of their paints. I'm going to throw this on in a relatively heavy coat, nothing crazy, but relatively heavy for an acrylic um, because of the technique that I'm using here with the paper to remove some of it and give it some texture. Now you can also do this with saran wrap or basically any kind of plastic or anything like that. Um, some products will take off more of the paint than others. The paper I find gives it a slightly heavier texture which is why I'm using it in this case. And if you were looking for more specific tutorials on that technique, you can look up the ripple effect and you will find it pretty much everywhere. A lot of people have used it and know how to do it. I've used it on other projects before. You can start by applying the paper kind of flat and then you can crumple it up and smash it against the surface to kind of get a more textured look if you need one. Now I'm going in and re-blacking out the sides to make sure that they're what I want them to be and then I'm putting in a nice tight veneer around the outside. This is still using the acrylics. These are the Wicked acrylics which are made by the same company as the AutoWare paints. They're Createx and I'm using my favorite mini gun here. Um, because I can't afford a sated jet. So this is the Warwick 878 SHE. There's a Warwick link in the description too. If you are a paint gun guy, feel free to check that out. I'm running a 1.2 millimeter nozzle on this one, which allows me to get that decent flow that I need for that textured finish I was doing before. But also you can see here, I can get some very good control with this gun and it allows me to do stuff like paint these thin bursts around a headstock, which is something you can't do with a full size version. I'm using an airbrush here to spray through the cutouts and kind of black out the inside of this. I can't really do that with the gun um, because of the fan pattern and just the way it's set up. To be able to get this done properly, I want to kind of be able to put the airbrush through that hole and then do a very careful burst around the outside. So I've put just a very, very thin vignette around the outside of that. Now for the bottom, I'm putting a candy blue on top of this texture and you'll see that the silver, the sparkle, all of it shows right through the candy. That's the beauty of candy paints. They are a difficult type of paint to apply in that you have to be very careful about how even they are because if you overlap one area more than another it's going to show up unlike if you're doing it with an opaque paint but you get this really nice effect from it where you can see right through. The back I'm leaving with this cool silver textured effect I think it looks really nice and I'm going to leave the headstock matching that because that's going to run straight down the middle of the guitar so you'll notice I only painted a small portion with the blue and the headstock is still silver. You'll see the silver running down the middle. We're going to come in. I have to wait another day, which is why you're getting all this B-roll footage, because I'm now going to take a bigger paint gun that I use to spray lacquer, also a Warwick gun, the 904, and I'm going to mix this color tone dye into some Bellin stringed instrument lacquer. The lacquer here is acting as a carrier to essentially turn this into a candy paint using that dye and this is the same color that I used for my base on the back of the neck when you saw me dye that earlier by hand. So I use this kind of mixed candy that I've created here to do the top and you may be familiar with this color theme. Uh, it's a popular one among my American viewers. Uh, many of them have asked me about it. And really, what better time to do a demo of it than when I'm painting a guitar for an American YouTuber. So, there we go. We've got our candy on the top there. And here's what we're kind of left with as far as a color scheme for the front. And we're going to keep this monochromatic texture on the back. So, 
very pleased with how this has gone so far. It's looking really nice in my opinion. I need to make sure at this point in the project that I give that lacquer ample time to dry because I want this guitar to have really good protection, which means my final finish with it is not going to be a nitrocellulose lacquer. It is instead going to be this two-part catalyzed polyurethane. This is an automotive grade finish. It's what they use for a clear coat on cars. So it is more durable. It stands up to, you know, weather and stuff like that, which hopefully your guitar will never have to. The thing I will note about this is because it's catalyzed, it dries and hardens quickly. It gets very hard and it is very concentrated in isocyanates compared to most paints. So you'll notice that I am wearing a full face respirator for this portion, or hopefully you will have noticed, as opposed to the half mask, which I sometimes wear for things like airbrushing. That is because this paint is highly toxic, very hard on the lungs. I'm even wearing gloves. You don't want to get this stuff on you. You don't want it in your eyes. You certainly don't want to be breathing it in. And you can smell it from a mile away. It smells just like cancer. And, uh, well, that's how you know it's working. But try at all costs, essentially, to avoid breathing this stuff in if you can. I'm also spraying directly in front of a booth. That is both to pull the fumes away from myself for safety reasons, but also to pull air away from myself and filter it in order to kind of provide a, a better dust-free environment to spray. I don't have my setup rigged up to go in the booth at the moment. It's kind of a tabletop style booth. Uh, I will be setting up something like that at some point here, but for now, right in front is about the best I can do. So for this finish, I'm going to be applying three coats and they're done in a very similar manner to the sealer. They're sprayed about 10 to 15 minutes apart and you still want to get about that 15% overlap. Your first coat goes on nice and light as a tack coat and then the subsequent coats go on a little heavier so you get nice flow on there and the paint can level off and look nice and glossy. So here you're getting the point of view perspective again. I think uh, this one's a little less nauseating than having it mounted right on the gun. So maybe we'll stick with uh, something more like this in the future. You may have noticed I always start with the sides and then I move on to the back and I finish with the front of the guitar. That is because I want to make sure that I am coating over any overspray that ends up on the back and then finally over any overspray that ends up on the front. Uh, so that I don't get those dry spots on what I consider to be the most important parts of the guitar and the parts that are the most difficult to fix and show the problems the most. This is what we're left with as far as our wet finish. As it dries and cures, this clear coat will kind of shrink slightly and lose a little bit of that really wet look that we uh, get when we've just sprayed it. So that's kind of why we have to polish it back to that wet look if that's what we're going for on a full gloss job. Sometimes you are able to preserve that, but here we can see in our dry version, which is the next day, um, that's what you're seeing right now. That gloss is just slightly different because the clear coat is pulled a little. So what I'm going to do is go through my polishing process here. I'm going to not really explain that to too great an extent because I have a whole bunch of videos on how to do it, and frankly, it's somewhat tedious. But the gist of it is you sand your paint back level with you know, something like a thousand grit paper, for example. Then you move up in grits. I'm using a little bit of wax and grease remover to carefully lubricate this because I don't have the really high quality paper on this thing right now. With some of the nicer, newer papers, you don't have to worry about lubricating it. You can just sand dry. And in fact, that's what I'm doing here with these round pads that you'll see me use. I'm sanding dry. These are the higher quality papers and essentially they're polishing this surface for me to basically a semi-gloss sheen because I'm going all the way up to 5000 grit. And I actually really love the finish that I get out of this just by kind of buffing this out with a very, very high grit paper. I'm quite fond of that. But for the purposes of uh, Dan's finish, what we're going to do is come back in with my polisher and take this thing up to a nice high gloss. So I'm going to be using some new pads that I got that are made by Hexlogic, a nice porter and cable polisher that uh, works well on a budget, if you will, and then kind of an interesting three-part polishing system that I've been using where I begin with the Norton Liquid Ice, which is a kind of one-stage compound and polish that you're supposed to be able to use by itself to do a finish like this. But then I like to come in afterward with the 3M Ultrafine Machine Polish and then finally with their blue kind of glazing putty 
to finish off. Make sure you clean the surface between polishes if you're going to be doing this. The compounds are actually abrasive and so are the polishes, but the compounds are more abrasive, of course, to kind of get you started. Um, so if you go straight in with a polish over a surface that has compound on it, well, you're going to continue to make the scratches that you would have created using the compound and you're never going to get that kind of perfect finish. So again, just make sure you're cleaning in between. I'm on the final stage here. Uh, like I said, if you want more information about polishing, check out one of my other videos on that. I have a bunch of them where I used a kind of even more inexpensive and smaller polisher to do some nice work. But for this one, we're just right on the final stage here. You'll notice I don't have polish kind of all over this thing. It's it's a fairly small amount that you need. You pre-lubricate your pad, and then you put a couple drops on there, and you go for it. Uh, you don't want to be spraying polish all over the place. It won't help, and in fact, it makes it harder to get a nice finish. So this is what we're left with for the surface of the guitar. I'm pretty happy with that. I, uh, I hope Dan is too. There is a little bit still kind of going on from the texture of the finish and if you wanted to you could go in and put several more coats of clear on and sand back again and really make sure that that is absolutely 100% factory mirror smooth. Personally I really like doing that for a uniform either sparkle finish or a single color finish something like that. But when it comes to these texture finishes or finishes on, for example, a spalted wood or a burl, I just find that they have a little bit more character if you let a tiny amount of that texture show through but without allowing it to look like orange peel. you got to be careful about that. If you just let it look like orange peel, then it's going to simply look like you didn't finish the job off. But, of course, to each their own. Arguably, a little bit of orange peel can allow your finish to last longer because it causes the light to refract in various directions and prevents you from getting as much fading on the finish. So, really, it comes down to what do you want to do or what does your customer want to do. For this part, I've gone in over that water-based dye that I applied at the beginning and I've put on an alcohol-based black dye on top of that. The alcohol-based dye dries much faster and doesn't penetrate as deep. So now, when I come in with my high grit sandpaper, I'm using 1500 grit to apply the wipe on poly. It's a satin sheen poly, so I put it on with this, and at the same time, I'm taking off some of that black to kind of let a little bit of the red show through and give it that vintage kind of look and feel. Now Dan has told me he's putting together a playlist for this build, so I'm going to put a link to that in the description of this video and be sure to check that out. I think he's going to be continuing to add to it at least one more video after this one to kind of finish everything up and show you guys what it looks like, what it sounds like, and why he's probably never going to send me another guitar to finish ever again. This really just makes me want to build a guitar like this, so hey. Stay tuned. Maybe I'll have to do a project like this soon. To all my fellow Canadian painters out there, I will tell you right now, for some reason, Americans love this theme. The, uh, the Dutch flag is a thing for them. I don't know why. I, at least I think it's a Dutch flag. It might be the French flag if you turn it, but I mean, it's a guitar. So yeah, really popular. So guys, if for some reason you haven't checked out Dan's channel, the link is in the description. You really need to go do that. Honestly, the guy is a master at getting things done on a budget. He does a fantastic job and he does it without all these goofy tools that I have to use to be able to do something like this. And most importantly, he really knows his way around a guitar kit. So make sure you check him out. Dan, I hope you like the paint job. That's a pretty sweet looking guitar. Uh, yeah, and I guess I hope you're a fan of the Netherlands. As always guys, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate it. And remember to subscribe so you can see the other paint jobs I got coming out. All right, let's go fire some lacquer at something. See you later, guys.